was an incident similar to that, that obviously there's no, nothing exactly similar, but the North Hollywood shootings or something like that, where there was a lot of that kind of chaos going on that you were involved in, either, either as police chief or as police officer? Well, I, how many of you were here in 65? 65. <laughs> okay, so you won't have a clue what I'm talking about. But uh, if you go back to 65 in the first riot in the city of LA, maybe one of the most chaotic events in the fact that department and the city was ill prepared for it and it grew over time and then what you found is that the department made some very tr strategic mistakes they thought that if they allowed it to go it would burn itself out and then f go away well it burned itself out but it burned up a lot of the city it was unique in the fact that it was localized in the south los angeles area it did not spread throughout the city but it did significant damage in the South LA area. If you jump to 92 on the second riot that was involved with. And what was your position in that? And then you were. Uh, 65 captain. was a police officer in 92. How many years had you been in the police department? I had just come on. I worked uh, undercover narcotics for six months and then the riot hit and I was rolled out of undercover narcotics and then I ended up going to patrol. And then in 92, what was your. I was a deputy chief at that time. Yeah. Okay. And so in 92, you have a situation where the Achilles heel of any police department are multiple simultaneous large events. And so when 92 hit, as I was standing in front of Parker Center and several hundred people wanted to tear down Parker Center, we were getting calls that people were needed in Rampart, in Hollywood, in South LA, and in the Valley. So multiple simultaneous events are the Achilles heel of any police department. And, but if you go back and look at the two incidents, what you'll find is some fairly significant similarities is that uh, in the city of LA at the time of, of 65, Bill Parker was chief. Uh, you had a department that uh, was viewed as somewhat distant from the community. Uh, in fact, Parker's one of his uh, principles based on the corruption that he cleaned up from the 40s and the 50s is that long-term close relationships with the community bred corruption. So he kept a somewhat arm's distance of the community. He believed in community relations, but the issue was that long-term assignments, long-term personal relationships were often the things that caused people to get into corruption. So he wanted to rotate officers. Rotate officers, uh, more what they call a, a very uh, uh, mechanized department. In fact, LAPD in, in the Parker era probably invented many things that are staples today. First police department to ever have a crime lab. First police department to ever use radios in their police cars. First police department to ever have internal affairs as a division to investigate crime. Uh, believed in the functional responsibilities where everything was run out of downtown where you had a bureau chief that ran detectives, one that ran traffic, one that ran patrol. And although we had uh, probably 15 divisions out in the community, all those activities were directed by chief officers downtown. You go to uh, 92, the transition occurs to where Ed Davis decentralized the department. He not only had then 17 divisions out in the field, he actually put deputy chiefs in the field in quadrants of the city to run all of those police operations, so a much closer relationship with the community, and he invented something called community-based policing, which the principle of it is every police officer has a relationship with the community. Uh, that has been somewhat uh, fractured in the last several years because what has happened is the city has decided to give the relationship responsibility to a handful of officers called senior lead officers, and you, if you live in the city, you find that you don't have really a relationship with the officer that drives up and handles your call. And so as you go back and you look at 60, 92, Daryl Gates is chief. Daryl Gates, although believed in and basically implemented most of the things that Ed Davis believed in, Earl, uh, Ed Davis and, and Daryl Gates had completely different personalities. Ed Davis could say something like, we'll hang him at the airport if you, if you, uh, if you hijack a plane and everybody took it as a joke because the paper knew he had a sense of humor and they actually referred to him as time as Crazy Ed because he would make statements like that sending the point. The difference is if, if 
General Gates said, hang him at the airport, people would actually believe he would do it. And so it was a totally different <laughs> situation that people believe it, uh, that General Gates was a throwback to the Bill Parker days, more of a distance, although again, if you looked at what was occurring, you'd find that it was somewhat different and that there was a relationship. If you look at both incidents, both of them, what sparked the riot was viewed as a pu police abuse issue. In uh, 65, the Fry incident where the CHP stopped the guy, uh, basically took him into custody, actually the CHP in the county, it wasn't even a city event. And from there, where people uh, basically thought that young man was mistreated, uh, the rumors went forward, the next thing you know, people were out and basically destroying their own neighborhood. If you go back and cut through it, what you'll find is just like any riot that has the police involved, the public viewed that the police were, were at the root cause of what their concerns were. They certainly had issues of education, economics, employment, but those were secondary to what they viewed as what was viewed as police yeah, and abuse. You, you use the word riot. I, I usually tend to use the word disturbances. Do, do you see a difference between those two? And you, do you think it was a riot, the disturbance, or both? Well, it depends on proximity. If you're there in it, it's a riot. <laughs> if you read it in the paper the next day, it's a disturbance or what else do they call it? Um, they revolution. Call it. Uprising. Yeah. Uprising. If you're there, it's a civil riot. Civil unrest. Yeah, civil unrest. If you're there, it's a riot because uh, you've not, if you've not experienced the fact of people being completely out of control to the point that they are driven to destruction because of their animosity about maybe not the issue that they're confronted with, but certainly something else that's driving it that they incorporate into that anger. And so at, if you're in that mix, it's a riot. In 65, when I was working undercover, one of the most chilling events, I lived in South Los Angeles, was to drive down the freeway and see just the flames of these fires burning. You couldn't see the buildings, but you could just see flames everywhere. The, the eeriest feeling that you could have, and on your way home to be stopped by the, the National Guard sitting in a tank was another eerie feeling to say, is this really Los Angeles? But if you look at that incident with Fry stopped by the police, people exploded because they believed the police department had been unfair and they were viewed as a target. And the other thing you found in 65, it didn't make people any difference that it was CHP. Because if you talk to people about law enforcement, they just collectively believe they're all the same. It, that makes no difference what uniform they wear. They just say it's the police. And if you say, is it the sheriffs or LAPD or airport police, they say it's the police. And so they look at all of it as collective, even to the point if they see some abuse in New York or Texas, it's the same thing. It's the police abuse. Yeah, I have two more questions, and I'm going to open it up to the students, because I know you have to leave exactly at 6 o'clock. Um, first question is really, can you prepare for something like the um, uprising in 92, the riots in 65, or what happened in Virginia Tech? How do you prepare for that? That's number one. And the second question is, um, can another riots happen in Los Angeles? Are the conditions present for that to happen yeah. again? Well, I think, first of all, how do you prepare? What you have to realize is that a riot, an earthquake, a flood, a hill slide, a fire, they're basically the same. They're called unusual occurrences. Now, there may be some unique twist within each incident that you might alter your tactics, but in all of them, you have to be prepared to bring in more people. You have to cordon off the area. You have to get cooperation of the public. You have to then combat the issue. And the difference is if you're in North Hollywood, you are hiding behind a, a building or a car because somebody is shooting. If you're dealing with a flood, you don't want to get into where the water is, so you're setting the perimeter much larger. If you're dealing with fire, you're there to support the fire department. So practicing unusual occurrences puts you in a position to respond. Uh, practicing interpersonal relationships with the public puts you in a position to tone down riots. It doesn't have much effect on uh, issues of fire and flood, but you, the better the interpersonal relationships with the police and the community, the least likely you're going to have some disturbance. 
In fact, one of the principles in LAPD that's on the wall of most stations says that there's a co direct correlation between the level of cooperation and the officer's use of force. That is a truism. The more cooperation, generally the less need of force. So those interpersonal relationships are important and it's too late when the first flame goes up to go out and start establishing them. They are a relationship that must be established, worked on, developed, and continue to work on on a daily basis because those kinds of relationships keep people from walking out of their house and burning up their neighbor's business. If you don't have that and people feel there's a disconnect, they will then find that the, basically to dehumanize the situation, they just view they're tearing up someone else's property and they don't have a real connection that is their community. Uh, if you look at, again, the preparation, what you prepare for is a constant effort of working with the public to understand their issues. The major shortcoming of police departments is generally they, have, they are uh, basically uh, have access to significant material, their data, and they'll come to a public meeting and they'll say, crime's down, here's the numbers, and you should be happy. And yet the public will say, crime may be down by your numbers, but I'm not safe in my community. And those conversations are in disconnect. There's a constant disconnect often from the receiver of the service, who are basically you represent, and the giver of the service, which is the police. The more you're able to eliminate that misunderstanding or that disconnect, the better relationships you have. So are the conditions right for another riot? You know, if you go back and you look at uh, the situation, you would say that th they are right in some regards. Uh, think about after the, nine, after the 92 riot, what was all the emphasis placed within the city of LA? It was rebuilding the buildings. Well, the buildings didn't create the riot, nor are new buildings gonna stop the riot. But if you go back to 65, 92, and today, what are the ingredients that cause people to feel hopelessness? Are kids today better educated? Probably not. Do they get more opportunities for employment? Probably not. Are there more jobs available in the community? Probably not. Are there more services in the community? Probably not. Are there more grocery stores in the community? Probably not. The things that cause people to feel a discomfort and a disconnect are the very things that you find in communities of color primarily, which happens to also be communities that are the poorer communities. Those basic issues still exist. Do people in those communities feel that they're included into the process? Probably not. Do they feel as though they are the subject of more police attention than other communities? Probably so. So when you think about the very fabric of what makes people feel disconnected and hopeless, a number of those issues, if not all of them, might still be there. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the students? No, I said the students. Okay, we'll have Dr. Marks ask a question. Okay, yeah, I have two. No, we have one question. No, I'm going to advance because I have this to look at. First of all, um, to what would you attribute the fact that um, people in our survey gave Bratton um, more favor, they were more likely to support his reappointment <coughs> than they were when we asked the same question about you back in the <coughs> Well, I think the thing is, it's very simple. Uh, from probably the first year I was chief, we spent most of our time dealing with Rampart. Right. And then from Rampart, we went into a real concerted effort by the then mayor and the union to say, this guy's a little too tough on us for on discipline, so we'd prefer to have another chief. So if you have that kind of onslaught of press that goes on Rampart, arresting officers, disciplining officers, dealing with the issues, the things that were important, that we thought were important, the reduction of crime down to the 1965 level, got lost in the translation. I think one of the things that's interesting in your survey, which we identify in the city today, is that even with a person that's been in office for five years with minimal issues of concern to the community, it's barely over 50%. Right. Also, that same person has not really formulated a plan to deal with the very communities that could cause the greatest concern. So whites at 
blacks at 44 percent, Hispanics at 45 percent, Asians at 40. Those well, we know our survey pretty well. That's pretty good. I have a memory. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the kinds of communities that you should spend your time in in developing relationships. And even I think if you find your survey, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but even though my numbers may have been overall lower, I think if you find that there would be higher numbers in the very communities that we have concerns about. That's a good question. We could look at that. Hey, were you surprised also in our survey that people, when asked about the LAPD, it was pretty high. It was in the 80s, 85 to 88 percent, both in 07, 02, and even in um, 1997 rated LAPD as doing a good job. So as an institution, people are very supportive of, of LAPD. Always is. The only thing that will drive down in my 38 years in the police department, the only time that LAPD suffered a drop in their uh, people's pr uh, uh, impression was right after Rodney King. It dipped. But what we've always found interesting in police work, police departments average 80 plus percent uh, generally where communities say they're doing a good job. They, the community has an ability to separate the chief from the department doing a good job. But the fact that the chief's rating and the department rating may be different. But what's interesting, the people who criticize the police department the most are elected officials and the media, who generally are in the lower 5% of any poll that people believe yeah, so as their relationship with the community. So that's always been a kind of interesting phenomenon to me that the most critical people are the ones that have the least support of the community. Dr. Marks, your second I, question? Can I ask one more? Okay. On, um, for our students, on page 12, we've got this question about uh, what proposal to reform U.S. immigration policy would you support? And I just am curious about your um, take on this because I know you've been out in front on some issues related to immigration, how to integrate, um, deal with um, is that, is that question 16? Question 16, yeah. Um, so the three options that we gave people were um, a guest worker program, a path to citizenship, and then fence the border. And um, just look at African Americans. Out of all the ethnic racial groups there, they were the most likely to say, I mean, most of them said you should provide a path to citizenship, but they were the most likely to say, close off the border. Mm -hmm. So what's going on with African Americans? Well, I think what you find is that uh, most communities that at one time were viewed as African American communities have gone through transition. So if we say communities that we generally identify, say Watts, yeah. are communities of South Los Angeles, if you drive through them, you find they're not black communities anymore. The, the largest contingency of black residents as a group in the city of Los Angeles can be found in Lamert Park, Baldwin Hills, Baldwin Vista, Village Green. That's the, the nucleus. If you go beyond that, you will find that it's that community that was viewed as black is now Hispanic. There's a tension going on that even in the housing developments where blacks that still live there, quote, believe that their community is, quote, being taken over. So there's friction there. Well, but there, you say believe, but the reality <laughs> is that um, immigration has impacted Afri African American communities more than any other, in that even when you have white neighborhoods that have completely been transitioned to uh, Latino neighborhoods, white had many options as to where to move, whereas African Americans had fewer options in terms of moving into another African American community, so they get dispersed. So, you know, it could be of opinion or even quantitative or qualitatively that African Americans have been impacted more severely by Latino immigration than any any other group. I don't agree with that because you, you don't agree with no. that. I think if you so here you got the Mexican guy saying that. <laughs> I don't want to deal here. No, no, I don't agree with that because if you look at it in reality, and this goes back another history lesson, in the '57 or '58 when the LA city began to integrate. Blacks used to live off of Central Avenue and East. When integration occurred and you could move west of Main Street, blacks dispersed themselves into communities that they normally didn't uh, live in. What you find that communities over the last 15 or 20 years that we thought were black, such as Watts and other places, blacks today have moved to Moreno Valley, Culver City. They, those with options have moved on. So they have not had a community, Hispanics have not taken over the community, 
they came in a community that was in transition because even today, to go and talk to blacks that may have some means and say, I really think it's important that you move to Watts, it would be a very short conversation. <laughs> very short. And so the issue is they have not been displaced, they've moved on, and others have come into the area. Now, compare that to 30 years ago when blacks start moving into South Los Angeles, they actually displace community people because when they moved in, others said, time out, I'm moving on. But blacks left the void, mm -hmm. and the void was filled. So Hispanics, in my judgment, did not displace them. They were not there in the first place. Hispanics came and moved into communities that were available. Mm. I'm not sure I agree with that, but yeah. since you, you're not carrying a gun, right? No, no. no. OK. I'm going to go over there, and then Daniel. Uh, I was going to ask, um, what do you think about Hollywood's portrayal of LA in some of the movies like Colors? Like uh, Frankie Day, like uh, Crash, they was portrayed LAPD. They they made you think that's an accurate portrayal. They think it's Hollywood. Yeah, but also compare that to Dragnet or One Adam Twelve. Yeah. You guys are too young to remember that, but yeah. those were like LAPD producers. That's right. LAPD did. Mm -hmm. In fact, LAPD had the final say on scripts for particularly no, Dragnet. Are you me? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Final final say on scripts for Dragnet, and to some degree Adam Twelve. Now, you, how many of you guys remember those? Uh, or they're not they're they're in night. So they're, they <laughs> they're in syndication. Yeah. But one thing you have to think about on movies that portray the police, just like, uh, what is it, Training Day and all that, what you have to realize, there is a departure from the realism and the tactics and all that other for the entertainment. And what we used to battle, Dragnet and Adam 12, is that we would say, here's the tactical and the proper way to do it. And they'd say, this isn't entertaining. So therefore, they would go the entertainment. If you look at some of the movies that are out today about policing, most of the people in the police film that portray themselves as officers would all be in state prison by the time the movie's over, by the way they conduct themselves with the public and how they conduct themselves in doing their job. The, the <laughs> unfortunate thing is that many people believe that the way you interview people is stick a gun in their ear or their mouth because it's entertaining, but that's a felony. That's something that you wouldn't condone nor would you allow to occur, and anyone that did that would get arrested even though they carried a bat. There are glimpses of truth in some of those movies, but they're highlighted by the entertainment value. They're not documentaries, so that's the key factor to look at when people say, you know, the uh, different movies you see, they're not documentary. They're not things in which they're based on true facts. There may be a marshal of truth in it, but it's done for the entertainment value. Yeah, but you understand that, I mean, because I, every time they portray professors on movies, I kind of get upset, too. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. Daniel. I just wanted to jump off of the question that Dr. Mark asked you. And you said that, um, blacks really haven't been displaced from the city of Los Angeles. Do you think that's a reflection of what the situation is? black and Latino students in the high schools, and a lot of it is because it, that's what it's attributed to. So I was wondering, as a high-profile African-American council member, what is your role in getting that message out to maybe follow the, the tension between both ethnic groups? Well, what we tried to do when they had the tension at, at Jefferson <laughs> High School, we had the tension, uh, on, I think, Gardena a couple of years ago when they actually stopped the graduation. My only high school in the 8th District, we went out to Crenshaw and we began to look at what the issues were there. And we started a program in which we routinely go out and bring Human Relations Commission of the city to talk to kids about their similarities as well as what they perceive as their differences. We knock on wood every morning and say that we haven't had a racial incident on Crenshaw campus. We've had other issues, but we've not had a racial issue. And so we tried to use the examples of what happened throughout the city to try to curb it in, in, in uh, Crenshaw. But again, at any moment, a situation could flame up that you have no control over, and you will find that some of those hidden concerns will add kerosene to the fire. And so it is a constant day-to-day -day working relationship to where we make sure our Crenshaw kids get exposed to things they hadn't had before. We'll send buses and take them to plays. We take them together. We bring them together. We talk on this issue. We bring Hispanics and blacks to their campus to, to show that they come out and talk about the issues that are relevant. And they also relate their relationship with each other to show that, yes, high profile 
Hispanics and blacks do get along. They do come out and say the same thing about how you deal with it. But tomorrow morning, if something happens to Crenshaw, the issue is we've not solved the inbred and the deep-rooted concerns. We're dealing with it from trying to educate our kids that they can aspire to be something without believing <coughs> someone's taking something away from them. The whole issue between black and brown, which is unfortunate, is that there is a very myopic view that they're fighting over the same crumbs when the pie is much bigger. And so they're fighting each other over turf that they don't own. I mean, so you have to start looking and seeing the reality is, why would you say the sliver is this big and we should fight over it and the rest of the pie is there that nobody's taking advantage of? So, hey, we have, uh, unfortunately, the council member does have to leave us soon, so we have uh, time for two or three more questions. Let me get Cornelius. You know what, council member, we're going to do? I'm going to have them all ask questions, and then you're going to have to answer by okay. integrating everything. All right, well, just okay. remember my age, and I can't remember well, so. No, it just, <laughs> you, you memorized our survey before now. Okay, Cornelius, then we'll go here and here. Go ahead. Uh, council member Barnes, you went from chief to city councilman. Can you tell us what you like about, what you like about being chief, and what you did not like about being chief? What you like about being a council member? What you hate about being a council member? <laughs> And do you see yourself around in a higher office, maybe a supervisor? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> hey, well, hey, wait. You got one question. That was like five questions. That's right. Yeah, well, he's going to answer. I was wondering if you can comment on the Rigosa's new plan to tackle the gang violence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 How do you feel about racial, like, you know, differences between, you know, police members and how they treat, you know, the public and other, you know, different ethnicities? Yeah, also, the, I mean, to take off on that is you, we have black-brown conflict. Was there black-brown conflict within the police department, or are they all blue, as the ad used to say? So they're, they're not all blue. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So, apparently, last week, there, uh, there was a riot in Northern Italy in Milan over uh, conflict. He had nothing to do with it. He was here. <laughs> Okay. Any other? What is, what is your opinion on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, you already no, gave no, it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was wondering 